This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, and it is my pleasure to introduce today Ben Lee Damsky, somebody I've known for a good long time. Um, haven't seen him up this way in a while. He's uh, one of our ANS fellows who lives far away from New York and so sadly don't get to see him as often as we'd like. Um, ben Lee, as many of you know, is a, a specialist in Roman coinage. Uh, he has published um, a few papers in uh, uh, the AJN as well as other venues and is currently working on a book on the Dewey, which um, he says he'll tell us a bit about, I hope, towards the end of his presentation today. Um, ben, uh, as many of you also know, is a major contributor to the Yale University uh, um, collection where he donated, I believe, 850 Roman period coins and um, uh, supported a chair uh, in numismatics there, which uh, Dr. Ben Hellings now holds at the Yale University collection. But Ben also has donated to the ANS as well, too, including uh, dozens of Roman coins um, that are now in our collection. So with that, Ben, Ben Lee, it's my pleasure to uh, turn it all over to you. Thank you. Here's the coins I want to talk about. Uh, these are two denarii uh, struck by Pompey and, and his uh, generals during the Civil War with Caesar. And um, you see the, the top one there has a, a portrait of Numa Pompilius and a prow on the reverse with a reference to it doesn't say Pompey the Great, it just says great. <laughs> That's, uh, that amuses me a bit. Um, the um, second one has uh, a bust that's not named and uh, the official description is Jupiter Terminus. And a little later, I'm gonna argue that it's probably just Terminus, but whether it's Jupiter Terminus or Terminus doesn't matter. Um, so there, there it is with the Crawford number in all its glory. And the other one, now let's, uh, let's get on to it. Just uh, to make sure everyone's up to date that um, uh, was a terminal bust. And this is a coin uh, of Augustus that actually Octavian, that, that shows a terminal figure. And uh, what we saw was a close-up of the top of, of this kind of figure that was used to mark boundaries. And um, here's a, a statue of King Numa Pompilius. Uh, it's important that we uh, get his role straight. He was the second king of Rome, and uh, he set up most of the Roman priesthoods. Um, he introduced Janus and uh, built his temple. Uh, if you know the, this is the, the shrine that's seen famously on the coins of Nero. Uh, and he, uh, Going along with uh, uh, introducing Janus, he added the months of January for Janus and February to the calendar, moving it from 10 months to 12 months. Um, in, in his policy, he emphasized treaties with all of the neighbors and that uh, you always operated uh, in compliance with those treaties and you didn't do anything rash. You, uh, if there was a disagreement, you went to negotiation first before you turned to war. And in his entire reign, he never fought a war. Uh, he also introduced the god Terminus, built a small temple to him and started the Terminalia which uh, was held every year on February the 23rd. And the common practice on that date was that farmers 
would go to the boundary post between their land and their neighbor's land. They meet, <coughs> have a little ceremony and offer offerings of grain or wine or, or both um, to um, reestablish this is the boundary. It makes me think very much of the Robert Frost poem where uh, not Robert Frost, but his neighbor uh, says good fences make good neighbors. Uh, so let's talk about the first triumvirate. Um, we call it the first triumvirate, but the ancients never did. This was, uh, the second triumvirate was a, an official arrangement sanctioned by the uh, Senate and given official titles to its members. This was just a private arrangement between the members and they probably, uh, to our belief, would have called it friendship. The, uh, the members were Pompey the Great, Crassus, the wealthiest man at Rome, and Julius Caesar, the brilliant and bold up-and-coming guy who was anxious to make good. Um, Caesar was the one that uh, instigated this. He had had some arrangements with Crassus, but with Pompey, they were kind of uh, uh, butting heads. So with the, uh, with the triumvirate, they agreed to work together and get there. Each of these wanted things done, and together they could get them done. Otherwise, the Senate was at a loggerhead. Uh, two other guys were involved in this. P. Clodius Pulcher was the really wild child, um, and Annius Milo. Both of these were known for controlling and directing mobs, gangs that would uh, take over, often compared with the, the brown shirts of the Nazis. So what the, here's what the uh, <clears throat> triumvirate got done. Uh, Caesar was elected consul, and following this, he was given the assignment of uh, Gaul and given a five-year term as governor. And actually later, when that five years was up, he was given another term of five years. Crassus <clears throat> had a lot of equities who were his clients, and they were, the bankers were in trouble and with, with Caesar's help and the cooperation of the triumvirate, they got contracts renegotiated, which helped them out a lot. Uh, later, Crassus was, was consul in 55, and then went, <coughs> went on to serve as governor of Syria. But that didn't work out well. This is when he uh, invaded Parthia, looking to get a lot of military glory and didn't come back. Uh, Pompey was also uh, given a second consulship in 55 and a third one in 52. I'll go back to that again. That's when the triumvirate was, uh, was coming apart. Um, so, okay. So the triumvirate began to decline first when Julia, the daughter of Julius Caesar, who had been married to Pompey and was his beloved wife and had helped to smooth over relations between these a number of times, but she died. And the next year, Crassus was killed in Parthia. So just 
ipso facto, there was no triumvirate anymore. There were only two of them left. And that's a lot less stable because it's, it's like a, a stool with three legs can stand, but when it gets to two, it's, it's unstable. Um, and in 52, things just totally got out of, out of hand with the mobs of, um, of Clodius and of uh, Milo. And Milo was killed in a brawl um planned or unplanned i don't know but mob rule really got out of hand in rome and the optimates turned to pompey and uh gave him the consulship and they for a while they gave him the sole consulship he had he had no colleague he was running rome and at this point he cleared things up <laughs> pretty analogous to his having uh, cleared up the pirates uh, in an earlier uh, uh, period. He, he cleared the, uh, the mobs up from Rome, but um, now he was, now he was uh, supported by his former allies, the Optimates, and he didn't really need the help of Caesar anymore. He was with the powers that be, and they were in his embrace. And uh, that's when the whole thing uh, totally died. Here we see a monument, uh, not quite sure whether it's legitimate or a fake, but uh, it stands in Rimini. Uh, just near the famous Rubicon River. Um, and it says that uh, this was erected by Caesar as dictator, and it commemorates a speech he made in the forum here to his troops. Uh, this would have been the, the staging point after they crossed uh, the Rubicon. Uh, now, I guess I have to explain that Rubicon bit. Well, <clears throat> to put, put the, the pinchers on Caesar, he was ordered to leave his province and come to Rome without his army, disband his army, come to Rome. And if he wanted to run for the consulship again, which he did, he would have to stand as a civilian. Well, uh, Caesar knew that lots of his enemies were, uh, were planning to uh, jump on this and, and bring every lawsuit you can think of. And when he was in his consulship, arranging all the things that Crassus and Pompey wanted, he had done a lot of high-handed steps, which were dubious and were susceptible to, um, to court cases. So uh, Caesar hesitated for a while and then crossed the Rubicon and brought a legion with him, uh, stopping first at Rimini and then proceeding down the peninsula to Rome. Um, and um, uh, there are a couple of questionable things here. Uh, one is uh, he, uh, in his words in the Civil War book, um, he says that uh, his other legions were in across the Alps, not in northern Italy, which was part of Gaul then. Um, but two weeks after he crossed the Rubicon, two other legions crossed the Rubicon, two of his legions crossed the Rubicon. And clearly they were not, they didn't start from the other side of the Alps and get there in two weeks. Uh, they were already waiting uh, just a little distance back. Um, 
the other thing that's kind of strange is Cicero records a conversation that he had with Pompey uh, about a year before this, when things were beginning to look pretty dicey, uh, no pun intended. And, uh, and uh, Cicero asked Pompey, what would you do if, if Caesar invaded and brought his troops down? And Pompey had an answer. It seems he had thought about this possibility. And he said, I would take my forces to, to Greece and we would regroup there. And that's what happened. That's what happened. But there's another point that, that makes one think Pompey was certainly not prepared for this. And that is that when he left Rome and skedaddled to Greece, he abandoned the Roman treasury in the Temple of Juno. And when Caesar got there, there it was waiting for him. He was totally financed. So um, here's what happened in the Civil War. Pompey fled to Greece. Uh, Caesar took Rome and the treasury. He uh, pivoted to go to Spain and defeat the Pompeian forces there. Um, he lacked a uh, fleet to take his, his uh, troops directly over to Greece. Uh, then he focused his forces back in Greece. Uh, there was a little bit of dancing around, and they met at uh, Pharsalus, where there was a great battle. Pompey's forces outnumbered Caesar's two to one, but uh, they were ill-organized and came from a bunch of sources and, and don't seem to have been coordinated that well. Caesar's forces had been honed uh, and used to to action during his 10 years fighting constantly in Gaul, and they carried the day. So uh, um, don't mention it here, but Pompey fled to Egypt where he had some connections and, and thought he might have a chance of getting regrouping again. But he was met at the coast and by order of the the last, <clears throat> the last colony, um, he was executed on the spot. And that was that. So let's go back. Here is the, the, the head of, uh, of Numa Pompilius. And it says Numa right there on his uh, diadem. So there's no clear, it's absolutely clear who this is. And uh, what I would say is that uh, Pompey, first of all, is calling attention to Numa Pompilius as a claimed ancestor. And second, pointing out indirectly that Numa was the man of peace and of following treaties and agreements. And that's not the way Caesar had acted. And on this one, we see uh, the head of uh, Terminus or Jupiter Terminus, but Terminus is the operative word and that's to say that boundaries are sacrosanct and will be observed. And that is specifically what Caesar had not done. He had crossed the Rubicon, the boundary between his province and Italy, something that he was ordered not to do. He had ignored that boundary. And 
just to make it also clear, um, the Rubicon was a small, insignificant river that ran from the spine of the Apennines uh, over to the coast, uh, ran, ran eastward to the coast, almost at the same spot run, on, on the Apennines, running westward to the coast was the Arno, the, the river that goes through Florence. So that'll give you an idea. Those two rivers formed the boundary between the province and Italy. And that'll give you an idea of about where it is. Uh, the first city south of the border is, is Rimini. And that is, indeed is where we know or where it's recorded that Caesar spent his, his first night. So uh, I say this is a uh, propaganda piece that's pointing out how, how uh, Caesar uh, flagrantly violated the boundary marker and was not in, in the spirit of, uh, of Numa Pompilius. Um, this, um, okay, so let's go on. Uh, I'm now, whoops, not sure how to go back. Okay, uh, now I'm going to go into heresy right here, and I would advise you that you might want to have a crucifix or a mezuzah or if secular, a clove of garlic ready because uh, everything from here on out I'm going to say is heretical and what I'm aiming to do is to convert you into heretics too. Um, we've all been told there the Romans didn't do anniversary coins. Well, if I can't say that, I'm going to say they did jubilee coins, coins struck on special occasions that were anniversaries on the 25-year cycle of important events. And we'll see coins celebrating Numa. And here's the... Uh, the subjects that they use to represent Numa and, and his qualities. Foremost is Pax, uh, the fact that he followed treaties, the, the establishment of Janus, uh, improving the calendar, and instituting the priesthoods uh, so uh, all the rites of, of Rome were, uh, were properly observed and, and bringing the gods onto the side of Rome. Um, it's, uh, the other thing I want to say about coins of Numa that, that I'm going to show as Jubilee coins, uh, they show up on Jubilees of his accession, uh, the, the, his accession to reign and his death two important milestones. So here's the first one of these, our first one of my candidates. Uh, and I, I'm gonna show you a, a bunch of coins here and they're gonna be, the format's gonna be the same. I'll show you the coin and underneath what the Crawford number and Crawford's date. The, uh, on the other side, will be my interpretation of this coin in relation to Numa Pompilius. Here it's the 500th anniversary of his accession, which, which occurred in 215. And you see Crawford, it's down here. Uh, Crawford gives a date of 225 to 212, so it's within that, but he's pretty vague. But if you look at this coin, on the one side, it shows Janus. And on the other, there is an, an oath scene taking place between the two 
I'll call them dignitaries. Uh, the tall bearded one at the left, who's reaching down with his sword to touch the pig, which is about to be sacrificed, is King Numa Pompilius. And the other fellow is representing some other city that's going into an alliance with Rome. So both sides have, have uh, scenes uh, or objects that are related to King Numa Pompilius. Here we are a um, hundred years later, and here's a denarius with Janus showing up. And uh, Crawford says 114 or 113, and, and the, the, the accession anniversary was 115. So I think he's off a little. Um, here we are just after that. Um, it's another coin that clearly has Numa Pompilius. It's, it's labeled so on the reverse. Um, not sure what the ceremony is, but he's about to sacrifice a goat. Uh, and it's, it's labeled Numa Pompilius. Uh, and on the other side, uh, Crawford says this is uh, Apollo, but certainly doesn't look like a laurel wreath. Uh, and I think this is the genius of Numa uh, wearing the myrtle, myrtle being the tree that was associated with him. Uh, okay, and a few years after that, here's an unnamed head, but it's got a pointed beard and a high nose bridge, which were seems to be uh, the hallmarks of Numa, and it's on the 625th uh, and jubilee of his accession. Uh, here's one where I differ from Crawford's date. Um, this is a coin that shows two kings. Uh, Numa is there with a beard, but uh, not a pointed beard, but I'll show you a, the bronze version of this, which has his name literally spelled out. Um, and the other fellow with him is his grandson, who was the fourth king of Rome, Ancus Martius. Uh, and uh, this was struck by a Martius who surely considered him and thereby uh, Numa Pompilius to be his, uh, his ancestor. Uh, this is uh, a performer, no doubt, at uh, funeral games because the thing about 90 is that it was both a jubilee for the accession of Numa and for the death of his grandson, Ancius Martius. So uh, it, it, both of those fit together for the date of 90. Here's the bronze I was talking about. You have the two heads there with the legends going around that, that describe, label them as the kings. And on the other side, we see ships. Uh, and in the background, uh, victory on a column. Well, the year 90 was also the 150th anniversary of the end of the First Punic War. And we know there was a column of Dullius that was erected in the Forum uh, to celebrate his, his victory at Miley, so uh, in, the, in the First Punic War. So uh, I really believe this is a coin that has three jubilees, all of which fell in 90. And uh, Crawford's date of 88 is off by two years. Okay, now, uh, 
this this is uh, our subject coin, and I'm going to just point out that this is the 625th death anniversary uh, of uh, of Numa Pompilius, and same thing here. This is Terminus, which was uh, uh, a god established uh, like Janus by Numa, and um, and so it's associated with him and appropriate for uh, a jubilee of his. Here's another puzzling piece that has attracted lots of attention. Uh, this is, I'm going to call it a medallic as it uh, is very rare. Uh, I think there are three or four of these. Uh, but uh, Paris has one, and and now Yale does. Um, it's got the head of of uh, of uh, well, now it's Augustus and uh, and Numa Pompilius, and it's on the seven hundredth anniversary of his accession. And I'll also call attention to the fact that by putting the two heads like this on the two sides, uh, they are also with the coin uh, setting up a kind of a Janus effect, two-headed. So just right for a January uh, um, donation of a gift, a New Year's gift. Uh, that uh, not quite as rare are uh, are the uh, small bronzes struck that year, giving the uh, the names of of the three moneyers. Um, Calpurnius Piso was the one who put his name alone on the as, and Calpus was a son of Pompey. So Calpurnius Piso is also uh, saying that he was descended from, uh, from Numa Pompilius and from his son, uh, yeah, son Calpus. Um, a couple of these here, both of these are examples from Berlin. Um, here's another piece that uh, it's often said that this is the famous white sow that uh, Aeneas found, but uh, the the date seventy seven was the seven hundred and fiftieth death anniversary of Numa, and he used those pigs in his uh, uh, treaty sacrifices. So I wonder if this wasn't another reference to Numa. A few years later, a few years later, here is another very rare piece. To my knowledge, there are three of these. Um, and it's, it's the best view on an ancient coin of the Arapacus. And you see it's flanked by two figures and they're not labeled, but I am sure that they are Augustus and Numa Pompilius. Um, so the date of 80, 86 was the 800th anniversary of the accession of Numa. Another coin that is kind of medallic and has attracted a lot of attention. Uh, a really special portrait uh, of Hadrian. Uh, the new Abdian in the new RIC says this is dated to the mid 130s. Uh, and I'm going to put it at 136, which would make it the 850th anniversary of Numa's accession and the wonderful figure there uh, done in a medallic style is Pax. Um, 
also not dated better than mid 130s is is this unusual design with telus or the world sometimes described as earth but world is perhaps a better translation uh, she's sitting there with a globe and in in this view we just see telus with her globe hadrian did a medallion where the four seasons are uh, kind of dancing over the globe. Uh, we'll see that version uh, later under, under Commodus. And, uh, and as I say, the, it was on the medallion, but the Cistercius that, that uh, Hadrian struck uh, was, was without the four seasons. But it, it is a reference to the stability of the world with, with the stability of the calendar. Now here, for the 900th anniversary of Numa's accession, we have a whole bouquet of uh, coins and medallions struck by Commodus. I'll start with this Arius, which shows Janus in a shrine. And here is Janus in a shrine. Uh, this is not in RIC. Uh, and to my knowledge, there are only two of these, uh, the denarius uh, denomination, that is. Uh, and here's uh, Cistercius. Um, and to make sure that you understand that this is an important type, he also did a medallion. Um, and drove it home with not just the standing figure, but this uh, this uh, Janus bust. And here, a crazy one where one of the faces of Janus is the face of Commodus. And here, as I was telling you, is that that figure of uh, Tellus, um, and you see her with the four seasons. These and this one, they're girls. Uh, more commonly, they're boys, but sometimes they're girls too. Going ahead, here's another jubilee. It's the 875th death of Numa. And here's an arius, and I'll show you just in a moment, a denarius of Septimius Severus, uh, not really known as a peaceful guy. Uh, but the figure here is the founder of peace, Fundator Pacus, the founder of peace. And people have always assumed, well, this is a topical coin. This is Septimius Severus celebrating himself as a peacemaker. Well, maybe he did want to call himself a peacemaker, but he wanted to say that he was in the great tradition of Numa, who was the real founder of Roman peace. Here's the denarius. And it slipped back. Okay, 25 years, a few years later, we have an accession jubilee with the head of Gita and, uh, and a figure of Janus. Moving ahead further, 950th anniversary of his accession. Here's this Pax coin uh, under Maximinianus. See it on a Cistercius as well. And, uh, uh, this is Volusian. Um, all we know for sure is 252, 253, because those are his dates. Uh, 
but his uh, Numa's death anniversary came in 252. So I think that's the, the uh, motivation for this Pax figure at a time with not much Pax. Uh, under Gallienus, um, without any RIC date to it, uh, is this figure, uh, Janus the Father, which is one of the titles of, of Janus, uh, emphasizing his importance. Um, and no date, but it would fit with the 975th Jubilee of his accession in 261. And all I can see is it does seem like an earlier rather than a later uh, Gallienus. Uh, here's also a, uh, an Oz, and, and I think they're getting pretty rare this late uh, in Roman history. So uh, it's got SC on it, but I think they were kind of special issues when they came along this, this late. So I'm ascribing it to the same event in 261. Now, this is um, Diocletian and we see figures of the four seasons. And I haven't got dates for this, but I'm going to say that it is the next accession anniversary. There we go. Um, is 1000th in 286. Also in 286, um, We we have uh, we have striking in Britain uh, struck in, in Britain this coin and are really hard to date but I I think that uh, uh, a date of two eighty six is certainly possible and that would would be a a really compelling uh, event to celebrate. Um, well, that is my presentation, uh, and I'd like to in invite questions. Ben, thank you, Benley, thank you very much. That was uh, wonderful, and uh, we'll certainly open the floor now to any and all who, who might have questions. Just checking the chat to see if we have any there. Not yet. Mine say, mine chat says two. Yeah, we we do sometimes get people writing uh, questions in the chat, which of course all of you are welcome to do if you don't feel comfortable uh, raising your hands or speaking online. I don't see any questions. I guess you. Um, oh, Peter. Yeah, yeah this is this is Warren Esty. I'd like to speak as a statistician for a moment. Sure. Um, if you look at uh, anniversaries every 25 years, that means uh, one coin in 25 is going to be on some anniversary. And then if you do both accession and death anniversaries, that's twice every 25 years. So you're talking about one coin in 12 or 13 fitting that uh, possibility. And then if you look at things as common as pox, uh, for which an emperor might have reason to um, advertise he brought peace, there's a very good chance that something randomly having nothing to do with Numa would fit in one of those years. Um, I just wanted to make that comment. Well, I'll acknowledge that's true. Um, the only thing I can point out is that a lot of these coins were uh, unusual uh, medallions uh, or, uh, and not all of them were packs. Uh, 
Janus, for instance, is not that common a figure. Very good. Uh, Rick, I see you've got your hand up. Rich Weigel, yes. Uh, I, I would also like, I like the idea of the accession. And I, I would also want to look at the coins of Philip I and the Millennium and work I did on Ananias Pius, the commemorative coins of that period. I think they can fit in here. It just, I buy a lot of it. I can't be sure every one would fit this idea of accession, but I do think that's a, a valid contribution. Thank you. And, and, and Rick Bellison, I see your, your hand is up. Go ahead. Are there any um, historical references to coins being minted on these types of jubilees? No, not a word, but, but I'll also say, uh, uh, well, how, how often do you see references to coins in the literature? And, and when I say coins, I mean a coin type. Uh, there are all kinds of references where they're talking about uh, he raised a gazillion sesterci or uh, uh, amounts paid or, or, or paid out in, in liberalities or so forth. But um, mentions of a coin type are practically non-existent. Um, and uh, we've got a question here from Joel Allen in the chat. He's asking, could it be that Julius Caesar as Pontifex Maximus had claimed some kind of association with Numa Pompilius who had created the priesthood? If so, could Pompey have been trying to undermine his rival in a sense by aligning himself with Numa instead? I think that makes sense. Um, uh, it, it's certainly true that uh, Caesar was pleased to be uh, Pontifex Maximus <clears throat> and on a few occasions used that to his advantage. Um, and, and perhaps he would want to cloak his actions as, uh, as blessed by the Pontifex. <laughs> Very good. Um, and Jamie Gray is saying, fascinating talk, thanks. Would you recommend a book um, or two that covers Numa Pompilius, especially the topics you've mentioned, e.g. introducing Janus, Janus and Terminus? Well, the, the source is Plutarch. Plutarch's Lives has a book or a chapter, whatever you want to call it, uh, about King Numa Pompilius. And it is the source for just the major source for everything we know about his reign. Um, the, the other book I would uh, uh, recommend is um, the Plebeian Tribune, which is a biography of, um, of, um, uh, Clodius Pulcare, the uh, crazy tribune who raised mobs and, <laughs> and did uh, uh, legislation by other means. 